some of the topics. So it was a great introduction. Uh, thanks, all of you, to come. I'll try not to be too long. I have a PowerPoint uh, to show you, but because I've really never done, I've given a lot of speeches in public, but I never use PowerPoint. So I'm going to start with it. I might have to stop if it stops me from speaking freely. There's a constraint using these pictures. Uh, to go one step back, uh, when I started working on this book, I was talking to uh, Dimitris Kikioni's daughter, Agni, who's still around, the only one left from a five-children uh, family. And she kept saying, why, why do you want to write this book? I mean, you're a writer, a fiction writer, the last name. How come my father? I said, look, I had to convince her a little bit because I wanted her to give me information and rare pictures and find out a little bit about her father. I said, we live in Greece. Most people, when they think of Greece, they think of ancient Greece. And there's been enough books written about every ancient Greek, I think, that we can imagine. But there's people living around us, and because they're living around us, we usually don't pay so much attention to them, because they're in our life, and we think that maybe they're not great, or they're close to us. And my project, which is taking a long time, so I'm not that prolific, is to have written one book about what I call modern great Greeks from the 50s on, because the 30s Greeks have been also taken care of quite a bit. There's a lot of work on the Greeks from the 30s, the poets, the surrealist painters. But from the 50s on, there's not a lot of, let's say, New Yorker-type essays, think of like that, non-fiction books, that are readable for the non-expert. There's been quite a bit written on the Ikeonis that we're going to talk a little bit about tonight, but mainly by architects, and the vernacular, that's the word they use in architecture. The architecture vernacular is very specific to that uh, kind of technical world. So I've written, this is my third book in my non-fiction series. The first was uh, on Mikis Theodorakis and Manos Hadjirakis, two great musicians, sort of a cultural thing. The second was on a literary analysis of my father's speeches, called Life in the First Person. And this is my third one, and that's, it's been about 20 years for these three books, so I don't know how many more I'm going to do. I have some other ideas. And I'm saying that to hear who people like writing, to think about that you're in Greece, and that there's great modern Greeks that nobody really written about. So if you like that, project, we should take it on. And uh, I'm happy to give you guidance and hit you over the head. <laughs> so here's the title, uh, Life of a Creative. I like that word because, yes, Picionis was an eccentric archaeodifis, a man who loved ancient Greece. Probably, I imagine if I met him, he probably wouldn't like me. Uh, <laughs> I'm too spontaneous, I have an American <laughs> accent, and uh, right away I lose a few IQs, even your next. The British accent always raises the IQ of the speakers. So, <laughs> so I, we're clicking down a little bit, and I have to prove that at least I might be close to that in my talk tonight. Uh, the Acropolis, I say the Acropolis chapter, okay, because his whole life was not this bit of landscape that he did around the Acropolis, which is about uh, 400 stremata. He actually wasn't necessarily super proud of this. It was something that came to him, and he said, late in his life. And uh, I call him a proto-apologist. We'll see why I call him that. And how did I come about with Picoinus? I realized it, but it took a long time, and that's when you're not aware of what's happening in the world. And I liked your introduction about Athens, and I'll try and go quick. This is part of my talk. When I was younger, before, uh, in the 60s, uh, before we left Greece because of the dictatorship, I would hang out at this park in Philothea because we lived there. Okay, so I liked the park because I had that boat. I thought it was crazy to have a half broken boat. The TP, where in Greece would you find a TP? I was born in California, so I was really. And I went, I was in summers in Reno, Nevada, which actually back then had real live Indians. So the teepee, I was close to that. <coughs> uh, and that little fence and little things you could go under and crawl. Not the typical child's playground where you have swings. Okay, this was you could hide and sort of come up with your own little adventure story. So when I went back in 1975, so this is an essay called Personal and Impersonal Essay. So my, I'm a little bit in the book itself. Not, it's not a purely academic book, although I have lots of footnotes, so I could get into the Museum of the Acropolis and sell it there. <laughs> so I sure it past the hardcore academics. I think I have 60 footnotes. That's a lot of footnotes. Uh, I went to the park. The first thing I did, two things I did when I came back, and you reminded me of something very important. In 74, 75, our family came back after seven years of exile. I left when I was 11. I came back when I was 18. I went to Ambelotipos to see that building which I remembered, and it was gone, and I couldn't believe it. I still can't believe it, because that was like my signature building of Athens, this castle that you say, the pink castle, and it was gone. Next to it was the Athenian movie theater, and I couldn't, I just, I still can't believe they tore it down. And I tried to go into that park. When I went into the park at the age of 18, I was kicked out by the guard, because <laughs> you don't have children, and what are you doing here? 18-year-old. Uh. <laughs> I was so upset with that idea that he would imply why I was there. But 
then I would many times bring friends to visit to the Acropolis, and I felt the same mood going up to the Acropolis that I felt at that part. A certain, as if we're going back to the village, the Greek village, going around the Acropolis that Dionys made the landscape for with the trees and things like that. For me, it's like you're in Athens, but I can also visit the, the village. What I mean, I can visit nature, not like the park of Zapio, which is not something that excites me. From I don't have the feng shui in that park for whatever reason. Here, though, I can relax before I go to the Acropolis. And sometimes when I'm upset with the world, I just go to that place and sit and walk around. I feel like I'm leaving the hardcore, the cement part of the city, the clusters that you put it. And a little bit of the personal. And that was me when, when I would visit the park. Uh, and Hermione, one of our pictures back then. That's my mother and my brother, my younger brother. So this is the kind of guy I was uh, back then. Now let's go to Athens briefly before we get to Pichonis. Quite right that Athens uh, had what it had in terms of reign of terror, and Karamanis was the Prime Minister here that I met when I was 18, and he was a scary guy, and of course you're very impressed by his eyebrows, <laughs> <laughs> what the caricaturists uh, always bring out. He inaugurated something that actually brought a lot of the intellectuals and the sort of upper class bourgeois of Greece into the remaking of Athens. So he inaugurated a lot of projects besides the reign of terror, which was the building part. Okay, the Hilton was as you can see, there's the, the Hilton, which we know, and he has the Moradis Rumens, R-U-N-E-S, not R-U-I-N-S, uh, drawing there. So he actually hired some top people. He would work with Oxiavis, Kosandinidis. Uh, this was redone by the School of American uh, of Classical Studies, but inaugurated by, and sort of promoted by Karamalis, just in Athens. Um, the Eero Sarinen architect, who did a lot of buildings at Yale, as you know, the, with Styles and Morse, JFK made the Linikon Airport now under privatization. The embassy, yes, Europius and the Greek Secretarios sort of built it. This doesn't look so good, but so what can you do? This is the Ammonia, no longer, oops, sorry, no longer uh, Ammonia Square. Uh, they made a circle with a fountain. There was supposed to be a beautiful architectural design there. So he inaugurated that as well as. Uh, he put a very enlightened person in charge of the General Secretary of Tourism, an architect, Constantinidis. So that was the architecture of the day. Meteora up on the right, uh, Mykonos of all places, blending in with the stone. As, you know, you said half of my story, so I, I, don't have, I can go fast on this. Uh, blending in with the local architecture. You see how nicely it blends in. I'm not an expert in architecture. I like what's the story I'm going to tell you about Pichonis. And this is an ad of Aster Bujagmeni, which is also now being privatized. It was bungalows back then. And that was promoted by at least architects, not the civil engineers. So it had a different uh, different concept. Now, I couldn't find a picture of what the Acropolis looked from above in the 50s and 60s, which is the beer we're going to talk about. But uh, we have the problem that Karamanis was facing was elections in 1953-54, and he had done a lot of uh, inaugural activities, but he wanted to fix up, as you say, the Acropolis, around the Acropolis, because the buses would take you right to the entrance. <clears throat> and as you say, belch all that smoke. So the tourists would walk up, <clears throat> and then the buses would join, and he said, to, we need to find an architect to make the area around the Acropolis a little bit better. What he thought, as a, uh, he was then Minister of uh, Public Works, he thought, let's find a person six months, put down the tar, let's make it a walkway, and let's get over in time for elections so I can have one more jewel. Uh, and my hat and, you know, help me out on that kind of thing. He could have chosen Constantinidis, could have been chosen. He assigned his general secretary, who was the guy who designed the Hilton, he assigned to find the right architect. Dr. Chavis, too big an architect. Dr. Chavis was a guy who was doing Iraq, uh, uh, Pakistan, the whole countries, Brazil, with these nice, he wasn't going to do a pathway. I mean, Dr. Chavis is not a, probably a guy, but if he did a pathway, he would write a book about it first. Uh, and bring in ancient Greece and the circle, you know, Statistics, as you put it. So Prokopis Vasilavis, the general secretary, thought, why not get my former professor from the Polytechnic, Dimitris Pitionis, who was 69, who hadn't really done very much, actually, maybe eight buildings. Yeah. And they said, let's answer Karamanis without knowing who he was hiring, basically, said, give it to this guy. Let, let him start work on it. And this is him, he designed the hotel in Delphi. I, I give this picture because it really does give a sense of this humble, eccentric guy who doesn't really care about the material world, uh, doesn't care what, necessarily what clothes he wears, but uh, is always 
in touch with nature. And okay, you can read that if we don't have to read it. I'm going to get that a little bit to my notes. So Karamalis was in a rush, uh, but Picioni's was not necessarily in a rush. And let's talk a little bit before we get to the next stage, why he wasn't in a rush. He grew up in Moscato, outside of Paris. And at the age of about 10 or 12, how did he spend his time? He would walk from Piraeus to the Acropolis when he was a young guy. Back then, walking to the Acropolis, we're talking about 1910. It was not really roads. It was about 13 kilometers, and it probably took all day. But he liked to look at nature, and he liked to find the stones and maybe something left over. Uh, he liked to pass through the olive grove, of which there were still a few trees from Pisistratis, who had planted about 40,000, they say, in ancient Greece, and maybe there was two or three left. And he liked to end up in the Acropolis and maybe even Kasseliani. Uh, why? Because he liked to walk. Why did he like to walk? Because walking puts you in touch with the ground. It puts you in touch with the stone. He wrote a whole <coughs> elegy about the humble stone. It put you in touch with the Attic sun. And for him, it allowed him to think. When he had his classes later in the Polytechnic, uh, he didn't really like doing classes. He would never do a PowerPoint, for example, if there was that thing. And he wouldn't really take notes. He'd say, let's go out and walk. When we walk and follow the contours of the earth, we're following our own psychology in a way. It allows us to be more creative. Those two walks, that's the period of these guys, how they had their beards. There's Tamburoglu, the guy on the left who ended up being the first head of the uh, National Library of Greece, who was fanatic about Athens. He collected every single scrap of paper, about it, every will he could find, every poem, every ditty, every aphorism, and every apothem. So he had, three, he had three volumes, which are sort of unreadable, about Athens from ancient times until today, basically basic collection of people's writings, not really his own writing. But he did have some nice sayings, and he would say, Greece is a country where the most books are written about, but the least are read by the Greeks. <laughs> uh, so he was a little bit sarcastic about it. The other fellow that would go on the walks with uh, Picionis is this guy, Yanopoulos. Yanopoulos was in love with ancient Greece. Uh, and there was a question that they were always asking these three men, at least from what one can figure out from what they talk about, sir, just a sec. And it's something that probably bothers a lot, or we, we have all thought about. Why did ancient Greece come about? Okay, we had Persia, we want to call it an empire. We had ancient Egypt, which was a love affair with death. The idea that you'd be a free person in, in uh, Egypt, clear off that you're dead. I mean, you know, everybody was being buried with their, with their mummies and things like that. And suddenly we have, why did ancient Greece come about? I'm not going to give the answer. I'm going to say what they were talking about. Some people think it was the wine. Okay, I like that answer the best. The wine was the wine. The nectar. Um, for Yanopoulos, it was the light and the lines of the stones. The light of Attica, so for him. Yanopoulos was so in love with himself in a way that uh, in 1910 he wrote, he dressed up in white, white hat, white tie, white suit, white jacket, three piece suit, white shoes, white horse, and went into the Salamina Sea and drowned himself. He just couldn't deal with the ecstasy of life. Or maybe at all. It was just too much, the Attica son. These were his partners when he was in his teens. Our good friend Dimitris Pikionis, okay? And Kamburoglu, it's not uh, thanks to Ani Aya, who's the publisher of my book, Melissa. This is a hard picture to understand. It's the last tree, the last olive tree, where Kamburoglu is giving, he's, he's, he reads a poem in honor of the tree and he's kissing it. So this is the kind of energy that was surrounding Pikyon, the kind of people he hung out with in the young age. This is the, the, the tree, I don't know where it is, and I don't know if anybody would even know where it is, but anyway doesn't exist anymore from what we know. So there he's kissing it. In the Keramiko area, somewhere around there. Botaniko area. Okay. So, somewhere there. So those you know those things. So, uh, circa 1920, we're not sure when that picture is. Okay, so now Pijonis, uh goes abroad to become an architect. Back then it was also a little bit civil engineering. It wasn't such a clear profession. He starts off in Munich where he falls in love with Paul Klee and then he hears about Cezanne, he goes to Paris, he goes to the same free uh, architecture school that Eero Sarinen also would go later because he didn't have a lot of money. And when he comes back to Greece, he sees Greece in a different light. Uh, everything to him becomes contrast and begins to realize the importance, as, as John was very right to point out, of folk architecture, as you call it. You know, it's a little bit putting down, just call it folk architecture, but that's the name of it. 
That's sort of what, in other words, he got very excited by what the Greeks had done traditionally as an architect. And he said, forget all this schooling. Forget all this schooling. You take the local guy and he knows how to draw the door of his house on Chios. He did a whole study of a town in Chios. He knows naturally that he wants four walls that work well. They might have to be thick with stone. He knows what, how the air conditioning will work without any air conditioners. He has his pencil. He knows what he needs. He builds it slowly. And he comes up with a work of art. He was especially impressed by work of a, a house in Egina that was made by a local guy that had once worked with archaeologists. Uh, I don't have the drawing here. And here is a sketch. This is the kind of things uh, that you draw for the door of the church that we're going to talk a little bit about uh, in um, Lombardiaris. In the 40s and 50s, he already back then, in 1928, he first writes about the destruction of Athens, 1928. He's already worried about the impending pressure. This is 1928 when the first refugees were coming in, basically, from Asia Minor. And he sees a little bit of the chaos. Of course, 1928, Athens was nothing like today. Uh, and he says, he writes back then, that it doesn't matter what laws we pass to protect our environment. It depends on who's going to apply the law and how we feel about it. If we're not trained and we don't love the things, the laws are not going to protect us. He spends the 40s and 50s doing no architecture. He, he becomes a professor of interior design, of all things, uh, in, the, in the University of Polytechnic. The only interesting thing about this, only uh, this is the way he draws this, basically there's no people. He doesn't put people in the Attica uh, landscapes that he draws. He has an imagination of Athens without people. It's already starting to bother him, this pressing thing, crushing thing. He also does what I call uh, sort of Picasso-like, this is not one that one, but a little bit modernistic drawings. This is, I like this one because, you know, it's carried it, it's linked to the Acropolis. And uh, he also draws a lot of drawings with ancient gods, the Erechtheus, the ones who first came to Athens. Uh, this is his own design, the Acropolis with the horse jumbled up. So he does that, for the 40s, 50s, he's an older guy, he's in his 50s, so he's already served about eight years of his life in the Balkan Wars anyway, in the late teens, so he's done his duties. Uh, so by the early 50s, he's made a school in Likavito, he's done a, a home or two in the area around here, something in Salonika, and he's chosen by his former student to work around the Acropolis, the very uh, weighted psychologically, historically area to work on. Now you might think an archaeologist should take on the task. An archaeologist is not, his job is not to be a landscaper. And probably the archaeologist on the first thing he stumbled upon as he made the path, the first little bit of pottery, <laughs> okay, and we stopped. No path. No, he had to, what he had to do, of course, is take the old path, the old road out of Tar, for that took a few weeks. He started doing some designs on rice paper. Man, there's many of these. This is just one, not to tire you too much with that uh, kind of thing. And, um, this is not what the path finally looks like. As John well pointed out, he revised his drawings and on the job. But this was his concept around the Acropolis, a stone path, which resembles a little bit of one of his favorite painters. I mean, if I'm not an art expert, but right away we know it's Paul Clay, and it's even called Main Road and Side Road. So uh, one of his influences, and I'll get directly to how you might see some similarities. This is in the path. Now these are old pictures. Why? Because the stone is clean here. The stone has not been fixed in the last 40, 50 years. It hasn't been cobbled again together. It's sort of been left uh, as people walk up and crunch it. But this is today. I'm not going to give you too much because you're going to have to go do a little. This is what I call the, I call it the hopscotch. Uh, hopscotch design on the path. You know, Actually, he did like to look at children, and he had a very good relationship with children. And I think he did this because he would see, you know, how you do the hopscotch. And that's on one of the main paths. So these are my pictures. I'm not a great photographer. I'm not good at PowerPoint. But I'm trying to give you the sense of the Kandinsky clay uh, game that he has, and that we don't really notice as we walk up the Acropolis. Something nice here. Okay, this is a little bit idyllic. When he came across uh, stones, he would leave them there, boulders, unlike most people who would probably just get rid of it as being in the way. And just to give a little sense more, a, a little, like that sense from a distance of water moving. So even though Goethe might have said, uh, architecture is like frozen music, uh, some architects try to make things move when you look at them. And here's a lonely boulder, because he does love the stone. 
So as he began the process, the first day he gathered about 25 stone carvers, some from Athens, some from Tinos. Okay, we have experience and we know that we say, and maybe Sarah can correct me or some experts here, that, that stone from Acropolis, some of it came from Tinos. Anyway, there's a reputation of good stone carvers, anybody who's been to Tinos knows. So he had about 25 stone carvers, cobblers, and about three or four students from the Polytechnic who all became very famous afterwards. One of them married his daughter, uh, and the others uh, took from him and continued their process. Some lucky ones, and a couple artists from the School of Art to be with him. Now it's true, when he started off, the, with, he was also smoking. Uh, very intense person, he would have notes. He might give you quote in ancient Greek and hope that you understood it. If he didn't, he wouldn't try and explain to you what he was trying to say. They said to what do we do, uh, Professor, the stone cobblers, what are we going to do? He says, you know how to cobble. I'm just going to watch. Where do we do it? Where do we make the path? Is there some guidance? He says, two weeks, we listen to the earth. It'll tell us. Okay, imagine having the cobbler. But he meant, let's walk around and see. So they did find remnants of some of the paths. There's more than two paths. There's about four paths to figure out. Now, no architecture student has actually delineated Google Earth the pass from above, I tried to do it, but it looks disaster. Looks, it's not a nice drawing. So a, a first year architecture student should actually figure out for us what the paths look like, I would say. So as he began the process, Karamanis, who was then Minister of uh, Public Works, six months go by. And let me just read a little bit um, of the style of his work, if I can find it, or I have a quote from my own book. So one of his students, and this is a translation, I remembered Picioni's with a straw hat similar to the ones worn by the introverted stonemasons working under him. He wore his spectacles with those thick lenses. A half-extinguished cigarette lay forgotten on his lips while he murmured something like a chant, like a heroic song. He would suddenly get up and destroy the arrangement we had admired just a few minutes earlier. Then he would kneel down and ask for paper. With hands full of dust, cigarette in his mouth, and pencil in hand, he would re-sketch the idea which sprang from the new conditions and necessity. This too was to be rejected shortly afterwards, and one of us was called on to fetch a new piece of rock, some white pebbles, a few old mosaic tesseras. So everything would start from scratch once more with a new drawing. Then he would look us in the face seriously silent, trying to read a reaction in our eyes. We all nodded encouragingly, mesmerized at this time, this time it was right. But usually again he would take it away, a little stone, a big stone, and Karamanis got upset. I tried to find a picture of him. <laughs> being angry, but that's not considered the best. Speed it up, Professor. He said, if you want me to speed it up, you become an architect and you take over the path. So then there was pressure from the Ministry of uh, uh, Public Works. They had a supervisor from the ministry, and they said, we don't understand how this guy operates. He doesn't give us the plan. We're used to someone saying, three drachmas a meter, so many meters, 10,000 drachmas. That's how roads are made, that's how paths are made. This guy doesn't have a budget. He just tells us I'm doing this and this. So they put a supervisor on him, and then they put two supervisors. And the supervisors went to their supervisor. They said, we can't, we can't control him. <laughs> we can't do anything. Either you get rid of us or, and do what you want, or we have to stop him. The solution was to put one more supervisor on the same supervisor. <laughs> that was the, and Picciones knew this, and every now and then he was smart enough to write letters to the prime, to then prime minister. He had become prime minister, but then without having finished the path, that things are going well, and I don't have enough money. Now, the unique thing, um, one of the unique things that he did in the architects uh, mentioned it is, <clears throat> you can read this while I'm talking, uh, I guess maybe you can do two things at once, is that he would borrow from the area around Athens the stone. So he might find a slab in a neoclassical house being torn down, which was hurting him. He wouldn't let that slab go to waste. He'd put it into a bench. He might find another slab at a quarry. There it is, and you might carve it. These are all in the path. This is close to the entrance. I, I don't have a map to tell you where each one is, and you can do your own. In the back of the book, there's notes. I have put pages for notes. I asked many of the publishers to make it look like a moleskin, and people can take notes in the back. And also, because the ancient Greeks, when they went, uh, I don't have that one. One second. Um, so he would have the stone carvers also put their own, he would say, put your own heart and soul into it. So those little dots, they came up 
from carving the stone. It was sort of their way of putting their energy. So there's many places where there's these little holes which could be cleaned. That's why some of them don't look so nice. And as he was, uh, as I said, as he was making the, the project, it was the way I think of writing. You know, you have a first draft, you edit it, you throw it away, you make a second draft. That's why I feel like an affinity with the way he works. Of course, it was his land, and this was a work of art. And here he was um, taking four years, at least four years, four years maybe. The problem with nonfiction in Greece, we don't really know when he started. Nobody really knows if he started in 53 or 1954. I put 53. Uh, his son-in-law puts 54 somewhere, 53 somewhere else. His daughter does not remember. <laughs> There was no inauguration. It finished. And why was there no inauguration? I think because it flowed so naturally. And it was also parts that had, he got fed up by 1958, 59, he left it to his son. And I know, I can feel the different energy. His son made the entrance to the uh, Irorio Atikon. If you walk up the Irorio Atikon, it's very beautiful. If you walk in his area, you feel what I call that Feng Shui, just a different Feng Shui, different architect, different person dealing with it. So besides having the, uh, the, um, responsibility for going right up to the Acropolis and he did something else. He also worked a lot in the vegetation which we can't really see because in our overprotectedness for the nature around the area we don't even trim the shrubs a little bit. So he got rid of all the cypress trees as not being ancient and as, as competing with the verticality of the Parthenon. He had studied very well uh, the ancient vegetation and the olive tree was there, the bushes, he didn't want them too tall. He wanted places to be hidden as he walked up, a little bit like being seduced. So he didn't want you to be able to see the Acropolis completely, which you can't see when you're close anyway. He wanted you to get glimpses of it, a little bit seductive in a way as you got there. He also had a waiting area, resting area. I don't have the picture here. Um, I just put the PowerPoint together today, so I'm seeing it for the first time. Uh, so he had resting areas because the ancients, as they went up to the Acropolis, also would have rites and traditions. They didn't just rush up when they went there. Now part of his uh, project brief, as we call it, was not just the Acropolis, just. Okay? It was also a little bit farther down, the path to the church of Gumbariaris, which was completely reconstructed. It was wooden and he um, did this incredible crazy thing, I would say. The farther he gets away from the Acropolis, the more he does his own art design. The closer he gets to the Acropolis, in fact, after the entrance, you will no longer see funny things after the entrance, the ticketed entrance, I mean, of the Acropolis. The path is just stone cobbled. Before the entrance, he has this, what I call, Paul Clay Kadinsky. Uh, he, he thinks a lot about how the water will run. He's the only one who used 25 inches of sand underneath to make sure it gets absorbed, and he plays with the rivulet. You can also see the way the water, it does different forms. If you ever go up and it's raining, you'll see the water doesn't just go straight down. It collects in little dams and then continues. Uh, and in one place, one of his students told him, let's try the modern thing called cement. So there's two places at the entrance where you'll find a little strip of cement, that's it. They just wanted to use the modern material back then. This is so strong in terms of its texture, okay? The texture.